education and universities they have been involved in the rise and fall of civilizations the introduction of the new education policy started ruining what was in existence and 1850s onwards the britishers started establishing their own institutions it is only by taking back the universities and the educational system that we will be able to reinvigorate our civilization <laughs> In terms of the challenges I want to discuss one important matter I do not know how much it has been discussed but I personally think that this is something which has been impacting the Indian knowledge system in the universities in India on a big scale and right away I would actually want to dive into the cons- the consequences of colonization because it's basically colonization which first ruined the teaching and the pursuit of these knowledge systems and then once the political independence was achieved these knowledge systems have not really been able to find their way into the indian university system in a very big way the, the 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 process has started we have started doing some work in this area but i personally think that you know the consequences of colonization have to be understood in great detail in order to basically reentrench these knowledge systems into uh, the curriculum in indian universities uh, i have not been following the lectures so i do not know you know if uh, the landmark decision of macaulay in 1835 has been discussed or not but that was the period when there was a decisive uh, direction which was given to the colonial rule before that as many of you would know in 1784 Asiatic society had been established in Calcutta and the reason for establishing that society was because the britishers wanted to understand india its customs and traditions in order to rule india as per the customs and traditions of the nation this was an important principle in the earlier times you know interestingly even the imperial uh romans believed in this principle so what they were doing was something not in contradiction to their culture or their aspiration so the translations that began in 1784 of uh, the indian text that was basically undertaken to help the imperial nation which was written at this point in time to understand in india in order to rule it effectively this fact is known to a lot of people but what is not known uh, to a lot of people including academics is that these translations had massive impact and effect in the reorganization of the british culture of the british society it may be surprising to many of you that in 1800s there was literally no democracy in england none whatsoever england was basically ruled by a very few people through combination of monarchy and aristocracy in effect what you had was that there were very few people ruling the many and the many literally had no voice or participation in governance because of which 
there was mass scale oppression of the people who did not have any voice you will also be surprised to know that education was available to only very few people to people who belong to the class of clergy and to people who belong to aristocracy it was not available to the masses at all in fact the movement to bring education at a mass level in england was inspired by a gentleman who had traveled extensively in southern india and had put together a school by the name of madras school of orientalism when he went back to england the name of this person was andrew bell and around 1811 or so there was this massive movement which which was which was started by an individual by the name of lancaster who wanted to proliferate education around this time there was also a movement which was started to induct or induce democracy into the system and in 1832 britain actually underwent massive parliamentary reforms and that was the beginning of democracy in england so there were two things you know which were simultaneously happening and these things have not really been studied you know due to the uh, the presence of historians of a certain orientation in india what has happened is that the drain of wealth has been extensively studied and written about but the cultural consequences of colonization hasn't really been spoken about and these consequences are deep and they will have to be understood and addressed at a massive level if you really want to align your pedagogy to the transformation of india see there are two ways of going about the profession in which we are involved one is that we take take it as job you know come to the classes teach go back home the other is to inspire ourselves and inspire the students that we are teaching so that we can actually bring about massive changes within the society and when i look at the reformulation of the british society or the reinvigoration of the british society i find that there were only a handful of people who were actually involved in this reform there are not one too many people these people were called the radicals you know that was the name that they chose for themselves at that point in time <clears throat> now apart from writing extensively and engaging themselves in political movements this group which called uh, itself radicals also in 1825 put together a university which goes by the name of university of london now and you will be surprised that this university was constructed in opposition to oxford and cambridge why did these people put together this university they put together this university because the things that they were engaged in and the writings that they were doing were not really taught at oxford and cambridge what i'm trying to emphasize over here 
is the value of education. Education and universities, they have been involved in the rise and fall of civilizations, if we really look at history. In 11th century C, there was a movement which was started in Europe. It goes by the name of scholastic movement. This scholastic movement led to the establishment of some of these uh, renowned universities that you find in Europe. Oxford University, Cambridge University, University of Paris, Barcelona University, and a few others. Now, if you connect the dots together, what you will find is that these universities were put together and in the next three to 400 years, the countries in which these universities were established, they started rising and they started rising big time. Similarly, when you look at the situation in the United States, most of the well-known universities were actually put together in 1600s and 1700s. And within a span of 300 years, United States began to become a world power. Conversely, it is in 12th century, or rather at the close of the 12th century, when universities in India began to get destroyed. And I think when something of huge significance in terms of uh, creativity or creative work, which India can be very proud of, came around that period. The decline of the universities led to the decline of the civilization. And it was not just Dalanda University which was, which was decimated. There were many universities that were raised to the ground. What is the evidence that I have? When you look at the traveler of Hyunsan, you will find that in the areas in which he traveled, there were numerous colleges and, and, and universities. There's a particular term that he uses, you know, uh, for the description of uh, these institutions. There were Sangaramas. And if you really uh, translate Sangarama in the current context, you will be able to safely say that they were like seminaries. So you basically had a monastery and attached to the monastery, you had a college where education of different kind happened. So, you know, what, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that it is only by taking back the universities and the educational system that we will be able to reinvigorate our civilization. There's a connection. History throws a connection and it is important that we critically look at that connection. Now, going back, you know, to where I was earlier, In 1835, when the Britishers brought their own education policy into the Indian context, it is not that they simply ruined what was in existence. And even till that time, what was in, ex was in existence was massive. I do not know how many of you are familiar with the writings of uh, Dharampalji 
on this account. Uh, if you are not, you know, uh, his beautiful tree is definitely a text which I would recommend. And uh, in beautiful tree, Dharampalji is basically quoting the survey of the Britishers which were conducted between 1822 and 1825 in Southern India. And even in this period, the Britishers found, you know, four to five schools in every village. And there was at least one college per five or six villages. Education was available to all sections of the society, to all quote unquote castes. You know, it's not that, uh, you know, the education was controlled by the Brahmins and the education was only for the Brahmins. That's not what the data suggests. And this data, as I was telling you, you know, was not collected or collated by Indians. This data was collected by the Britishers. So, so, you know, the introduction of the new education policy started ruining what was in existence. And 1850s onwards, the Britishers started establishing their own institutions. If my research is correct, I think it was Elphinstone College, which was established in Mumbai or Bombay back then, you know, as the first educational institution. And over a period of time, you know, different universities in the, in, 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 in you know, what are uh, metropolitan cities uh, in India came about. So, the Britishers simultaneously, they were also creating knowledge on India. And the knowledge that they were creating on India, particularly on Indian society, was not being created based on their objective study of the objective situation in India. That was not, that was happening. They were creating knowledge on India based on the experiences of their own country. And I'm going very slowly about this. As I mentioned earlier, Britain was class-based society in 1800s. And it was such a kind of a society in which people could not move from one class to the other. It was a very, very stratified social system that they actually had. Why am I telling you this? The reason why I'm telling you this is that when they started writing about castes in India or the relationship of quote unquote castes in India, they were not talking about what really existed on the ground in India. They were actually projecting their class experiences onto the Indian context. This is what they were doing. And they were creating narratives on India. These narratives which were getting created in Britain were getting funneled into the Indian education system. 
it became part of the pedagogic narrative and over a period of time the falsehoods that they fed to us they became our realities this is just one part of the story first they created the narrative based on that nar narrative later they started bringing structural changes in india they started altering and transforming our social system in a very very big way at this point in time you know anyone who's uh, who's sensitive enough will be able to understand that the indian society has become deeply hierarchical and oppressive you know that is the reality that we have in india that is the reality that we find on the streets that is the reality to which most indians are actually subjected did we civilizationally behave in this particular way my my study suggests no this was not the reality the reality was something very different however through the educational institutions that they created and the alterations that they brought about in the society our society has become completely transformed and in fact if you look at the current social system if you look at the current social reality it will match with the narrative that they had generated but this reality is an outcome of that narrative this reality does not precede the narrative this is something which we really need to take into account you know i am talking about the 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 consequences the consequences of colonization so there are two things that i have already touched upon you know one is that the colonial narrative found its entry into our educational system as time progressed it gathered a certain momentum and post colonial and post independent india has not done anything of significance to basically alter or reduce the momentum it has become a juggernaut it started rolling and it is and it continues to roll how are we going to stop what what began in 1800s it is only through critical examination and a massive critical examination of what really has transpired during the colonial period that we will first understand what happened and then undo the damage that has occurred the impact of colonization unfortunately it's most on the psyche of the colonized that is where the maximum damage happens and if you look at post colonial literature there are three consequences of colonization in the colonized <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> it produces inordinate amount of inferiority complex shame and guilt and before you know before i get into epistemologies and 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 deeper discussions i want to begin with something which is very simple you know let me talk about the inferiority 
that we as civilization, we as a collective have towards languages. Most of us at some level have a certain degree of inferiority and shame about our native tongue. Most of my education happened in Delhi University. And when I survey the scene, I remember very vividly, and I do not think that the situation has changed today, even. The students who studied Sanskrit and Hindi were not considered cool or they were not, con they were not looked up to, you know? Their peers divided them explicitly or implicitly. That is the reality. And I think the reality continues. On the contrary, if someone spoke English and if he or she was good at the language, it really did not matter, you know, whether that, in, that person was talking intelligently or not. The person was considered intelligent. And all doors back then opened for those individuals and doors still open for the individuals in India today. The situation has not changed. Now, when you have something going going like this within the civilization, do you think that people are going to talk about the Indian knowledge system? Yeah, do you think that they're going to uh, study the knowledge systems which are there in the vernaculars? This is not going to happen. So there is, you know, at the civilizational level, this inquiry needs to happen. You know, when I go back to India, and given that Hindi is my mother tongue, my native tongue, and I'm, I'm very fluent in Hindi, I'm also very fluent in my, my dialect. I like to have conversations with people in Hindi. But the moment they get to know that, you know, that, that I'm uh, living in the United States, people want to have conversation with me in, in English. The language has become a matter or reflection of civilization. There's a... <clears throat> This individual, by the, this intellectual by the name of Albert Memmi. And Albert Memmi has written this wonderful book titled The Colonizer and the Colonized. And in The Colonizer and the Colonized, Memmi talks about uh, bilingualism. Memmi says that there's nothing wrong with bilingualism or multilingualism. But when, but when language, particularly the language of the colonizer, begins to acquire a particular status and begins to supersede all the different native languages, then there's a problem. And that problem needs to be addressed. I do not know, you know, how many of you uh, read the two book chapters that I shared with you. In, 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 in both the chapters, you know, I have quoted Benjamin Worf. Benjamin Worf says that the language itself carries a cosmology. You know, language is not just words. It has a worldview. It has a cosmology. It has a culture. You know, 
It has the wisdom of the ancestors embedded in it. And there is a very unconscious transmission of cosmology and culture and worldview which occurs through language. You know, when we were growing up, we learned language through osmosis. Nobody, nobody taught us our, our native, our respective native tongues, right? We just picked them up. So there is, you know, there, there's, a, there's a process of osmosis over there. And with language, we also pick up cosmology. And if surrounding us, we have the language of the colonizer, then we begin to pick up the cosmology of the colonizer as well. And when we begin to pick up the cosmology of the colonizer, it is not that we are uh, seamlessly negotiating in, in two different worlds, you know, the, uh, the worlds of colonized and, and colonizers. No, that doesn't happen. We begin to get attracted towards the culture, the civilization and the worldview of the colonizer. And more we get connected with that, more disconnected we come or we become from our own tradition, culture, tradition, and so on and so forth. Now, you know, this is, this is a massive challenge that we face. And I think that is also the reason why I'm pretty much sure that a lot of you will have a lot of difficulty about talking to your peers or your colleagues about the Indian knowledge systems. You know, there is a certain kind of conscious or unconscious uncivilization which is associated with the Indian knowledge systems. There's a certain kind of savagery, conscious or unconscious, which is associated with these knowledge systems. And to the best of my understanding, it is unconscious. So if you certain, suddenly become interested uh, in studying Sanskrit, or if you're interested in, you know, in, uh, in engaging in, 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 in some ancestral practices, you will be very, uh, you know, casually referred to as bhaktas. Your intellectual acumen or your intellectual capacities will be brought into question. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> you know, it is, it is deliberate on my part to be actually be dressing in the manner that I have dressed and come to this class. I could have easily worn a dhoti kurta and come to the class. And it is highly possible that, you know, that I would not have been taken seriously. Now, <clears throat> there are many scholars in India at this point in time who may not be proficient in English may not be dressing themselves in Western clothing, but they may, but, but they may have very good command over different aspects of the traditional Indian knowledge systems. Do these people have the respect in the society? We don't give them that respect. You know, I'm not saying we, I'm not talking about, you know, this group. I'm pretty much sure that many of us may be doing that, but I'm talking about civilization. You know, 
if an individual in traditional clothing, particularly a man, without an entourage around himself, goes to what can be considered as an elite place, it is highly possible that the, that the individual may get disrespected. This is the reality that our country is facing. So I would say that before we start getting into epistemology and the, you know, and the technical stuff, which of course are very important, these are the things that we really want, we should be noticing. And more than noticing what is going on in the society, it becomes extremely pertinent and imperative to look into the things that we ourselves are doing. What is, what is the value that we attach to things that are considered Western? Now, because of this deep in inferiority that we have civilizationally, and I'm not berating ourselves for this. You know, this is a consequence of colonization. All colonized people have this. They undergo this, you know. This comes with the territory. This is the nature of the beast. Colonization worldwide has created inferiority complex, shame and guilt among the colonized. And if you want to transform this, this, this unconscious thing, you know, which is, which is running inside our being, first will have to be made conscious and then changed. Because if we do not change this, if we do not change this, then what happens? What happens is that whatever gets generated in Western universities, that becomes putative truth, which gets uncritically swallowed by us. We don't even question that. We don't even critically examine that. If we do not critically examine what is coming from the West, we won't be able to look into what is there in our own backyard. You know, these two book chapters that I shared with you, I have shared them for a reason. You know? What is it that I start with? I start critically examining, you know, dominant Western paradigms through a methodology which has been, which, you know, which actually brings me to uh, the second concern that we have, methodological issues. Through a methodology, which is also Western, right? And given, and, 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 you know, and from here, here on, I would, I would be pretty much certain that, you know, that you would be very familiar with the lingo that I'm going to speak. You'll be familiar with modernism, you'll be familiar with enlightenment, you know, you'll be familiar with postmodernism and so on and so forth. So what is it that I'm doing? I, I use, the paradigm of postmodernism, postmodern philosophy, uh, philosophy of science, to be, you know, to be precise, to critique the paradigm of enlightenment and modernism. Right. So, in a certain sense, you can say that I'm using one thorn to take out another thorn, and then, by the grace of the divine, and you know, and I have no qualms in saying that, you know, because it actually is the gift of the divine. 
I turn postmodernism onto itself. You know, particularly in the sections where I'm talking about relativism and the paradox of self-referentiality. Self you know, that incidentally, again, by the grace of the divine, it's my novel contribution in the world of philosophy. When I apply postmodernism on postmodernism, there's something wonderful and peculiar that happens. You know? Postmodernism swallows itself, right? But when it swallows itself, I am not using to bring up or uplift the paradigm of modernism or enlightenment. That is not what I'm doing. You know? What I'm showing in those two pieces is the complete collapse of binaries, you know? True, false, right, wrong, and so on and so forth. And through that, I open a new door into looking at Indian epistemology. So what did I, what did I do? I used one thorn to take out another thorn and then threw both the thorn away, both the thorns away. And with that, what is it that I'm doing? I am landing in something which is distinctively Indian epistemology. The transcendence of binaries is where the fun in our epistemology begins. Let me shed, you know, let me shed more light into this, given that you guys have been exposed, you know, to many different knowledge traditions in the last 10 or 15 days. From the perspective of Vedanta, mind is not a singular entity. You know? Mind has four different aspects to it. Mind has chitta, mind has manas. You know, in fact, it is not even called mind, it is called antakaran. And an inner instrument of perception. It has chitta, which can be loosely uh, associated with unconscious or subliminal mind. You have manas or that aspect of mind which is attached to sense organs. Then you have buddhi, which is the discerning faculty within you. And very closely associated with buddhi, you have ahankara, the ego principle or the principle of self. And between buddhi and ahankara, there's almost a reciprocal relationship. Now look at this, you know, look at how logical this whole system is. When you are making a discernment, you will always operate in binaries. Think about this, you know, when you're applying your Vivek or your Buddhi, right? You will you'll choose right from wrong, true from, true from false, and so on and so forth. Discerning faculty belongs to Buddhi and Buddhi essentially operates in binaries. Now Buddhi is part of the Antakaran conglomerate, which is just one of the planes of consciousness. You know, there are many more planes of consciousness beyond mind. Those planes of consciousness have to be experienced in pursuit of knowledge in our systems. And, and there's, you know, and there's a particular reason why I'm using systems here. Transcendence of mind is there in Vedanta, in Buddhism, 
in Jainism, in Sikhism, and in Sufism. Transcendence of mind is a must. And in order to transcend the mind, it is very important that you transcend dichotomies and dualities. You transcend your buddhi. And because your ego principle, your ahankara is very closely entwined with buddhi, as you transcend binaries and dichotomies, there's a profound suppleness which is going to come in your ahankara principle. So there are two ways of making buddhi malleable. Either become truly humble, you know, or work on your buddhi, which is going to make your ahankara supple. And through this process, you know, this part of the inner work, this part of our sadhana, that we transcend the mind. And when you transcend the mind, you are not looking for knowledge in an intellectual manner. You are looking for knowledge in what can be considered as yogic manner, spiritual manner. All that you need to do in that process is to basically silence your mind, attain a certain kind of stillness. And once that stillness comes, knowledge descends upon you. You become an instrument, you become a conduit. And that is why, you know, the profound and copious literature that you have in our tradition has actually flowed through the beings who are doing their sadhana. This pursuit of knowledge is not intellectual. You're not putting two and two together. You're working on your being, you're engaging in psycho-spiritual practices. As you raise yourself, knowledge descends into you. You become a, you become a scribe of the divine. You know, it is stated that Mahabharata has been written by Vyasa with Ganesha as his scribe. The Westerners are not able to wind their head around this. You know, that one individual could actually write a text of 100,000 verses. You know, once the Germans started studying our tradition, they began saying that, you know, that Mahabharata, Mahabharata or different parts of Mahabharata has been written by many different people. No. There's one individual, one Vyas, who wrote this. And he wrote it because he used Sri Ganesha as a scribe. You know? This can happen to us also. This is, this is the kind of epistemology that we are talking about. What I wanted to say to you is that there's a profound legitimacy. There's a profound legitimacy to our own systems. And we can only open ourselves to these systems if we do our inner work which will also involve critically examining the consequences of colonization. 